Hey everyone, we'd like to work, welcome you and invite you to worship with us today. First John, or John 1, 16 says, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Let's worship. You have brought me to the water Where my past can be swept away In the current of your mercy There's no limit to your promise. Jesus, you have done it all for me. Jesus, you have done it all for me. Grace comes like a wave crashing over me. Grace comes like a wave crashing over me. Screw 
Let's sing that chorus one more time. thank you that we can count on your promise, count on your word that doesn't change, that doesn't give up when everything is going wrong, when everything feels hard, when we're feeling empty, when our heart breaks over and over again. You are constant and we can constantly just come to you when everything else fails, when everyone else fails us, when things don't go the way we, we dreamed, when we're just broken and have nowhere else to go, we just can come right to you. And we just thank you for that. And um, we just pray that we would rest in that this weekend and that we would be able to rest in that through this week and not just leave it here, but keep your love with us stay in your word come back to your truth over and over again because we need you because you're the only one that's constant Lord and I just pray that you would remind us of that and we thank you for reminding us of that and all the little things Lord and we just just pray this in Jesus name amen you guys can greet your neighbor turn and greet your neighbor talk to someone new maybe Good evening to you. If you haven't had grabbed a seat yet, why don't you make your way that direction? My name is Eli. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're just so glad that you're here with us to worship this weekend. I just have a few announcements for you as we continue our service together. Uh, just a really quick uh, piece of information for you. If you'd like to give here at Fellowship of the Rockies, there are many ways that you can do that. They're all listed on this slide here. If you're interested, you just take down that information. But I have two kind of ministry-oriented uh, announcements for you this weekend. The first being Discover Fellowship. This, this is an event that is a lunch for if you are new or maybe you're not new to Fellowship of the Rockies, but you want to hear more of our story, more of how this church came to be and, and uh, want to learn more, ask your questions about ministry here at the church, we would love to answer those questions and spend some time with you so that we do that in the form of a lunch. That's going to happen this next Sunday, the 21st, after the 1030 a.m. service. So next Sunday, you just mark your calendars for that. We'd love if you'd register for that. It's always a really great time together. And the other announcement is that we are launching another new ministry. One of our biggest goals here at Fellowship of the Rockies is to minister to every single age demographic that is in our community and in our church. And so we are looking to launch a seniors ministry. We're really, really excited about this. And so we're having an informational meeting on May the 24th about this ministry. So if you'd, you're interested in serving for that or interested in participating, uh, we'd love to talk more with you about that and, and kind of cast some vision and give some more heart for that ministry. So that meeting is May the 24th. We just, 24th, we want to invite you into that. And lastly, this weekend, is Mother's Day weekend. Obviously, Mother's Day is tomorrow, but we want to celebrate a little bit this evening as well. So if you are a mom, why don't you go ahead and stand this evening? We want to honor you because you are amazing. What you do is incredible. Andy, sit down. You're not a mom. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to the moms. And I'd just love to pray for you. You're already headed down. That's okay. You can sit down. I would love to pray for the moms, though, this weekend. So why don't you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the moms that are in our lives, for the spiritual moms and, and the birth moms that are, that are in our lives, this deep and personal and, and deeply needed relationship. Jesus, we thank you for giving us that. So, Lord, I just pray deep blessing over all of our moms and that we would have 
uh, amazing relationship with them, um, but also that we would just get to share in your blessing together. Jesus, it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. We're going to continue in worship with the opening of God's word. So what Eli may have left out is, what is a senior? Uh, so I think he was a little nervous about that because um, they, they said, you know, Charlie, we're finally starting a ministry that, like, you can be a part of. And I'm like, well, thank you very much, guys. So what do you, what do you consider a, a senior? And so I think they started at 55, and I'm like, really? And so I think it's at 60. So if you consider yourself a senior, uh, we already have a lot of interest, and in, in so uh, we've got a great leadership team that we're putting together as well. And this, is a, this will actually make a first here at Fellowship of the Rockies is we now have a ministry for every age group in our church, which we've never had that ever before. And so whether it's children, whether it's students, uh, young adults, the middle, whatever the middle is. And, and so now we have a ministry that I can, I can be a part of. And so you may see me there. At, no, you won't see me there. At, I'm, I'll be out. But you may see me at, the, at the, the seniors' ministry. And so one other thing that I've gotten just a lot of questions about, and so maybe I'll, I'll just announce and then we'll, we'll open God's Word, is many of you have asked, hey, what happened to, like, our uniform security guys? Uh, so that was Titan Security. They've been with us since 2007. We've had a long, long relationship with them. As so many of you know that we've led, I think we're up, I think we led four of them to the Lord, baptized almost all of them. And so, but they just started having serious uh, staffing issues and they were having more and more uh, problems and struggles in staffing our, our services. And so they just kind of abruptly uh, said, you know, in a couple of weeks, we just can't keep doing this. We just can't keep doing this. We'd love to, but we can't keep doing that. And so we have two levels of security here. One is, one is uniformed, and then there's another level that you don't see. And so, so we still have that in place. And so we immediately, uh, Mike Hinkle, our business manager, immediately reached out to Pueblo Police Department and said, could we hire an officer uh, uniformed officer that was in our foyer for all of our services. And so they, they came back to us and said, we just, we just already have so many shortages as it is. We would love to support you. We have a wonderful relationship with the police department. But they said, at this time, we're just not able to support. But if we get to the level that we can, then we're going to do that. And so we've reached out to two other security co companies, and so we're waiting for their bids to come in and some of those other things. So anyway, so I just want to let you know you're okay. Uh, you're fine, um, um, and so, um, and so that's, that's the story. So if you have your Bibles or electronic devices, you can either click to or turn to with me. Ephesians chapter 3, and we're just going to look at two verses, 16 and 17. Now listen, I'm going to read all the way through verse 21 because it's the prayer. There's a prayer, Paul, and Paul is praying this prayer over believers. And so this is, this is a prayer uh, that I have used in my personal life. This is a prayer that I've used for, for close friends, for families, for the church. And so Paul is actually praying this prayer for a church. And so one of the, one of the key phrases or the key words, and actually it's where the, the, the title of this message comes from, is deeply rooted. And so Paul was praying, and he was praying for the church and said, I want you to be deeply rooted. I want you to be deeply rooted in Christ because Paul tells us later in like Romans chapter 11, verse 16, I think it is, that where he helps us to understand whatever you're rooted in will eventually come out in your life, right? And so, and he said, he says, so you got to understand your root supports you. Uh, you don't support your root. And Jesus talked about that, right? I'm the vine and you're the branches. And Jesus talked about that principle. So it's all the way through the Gospels. It's all the way through the, the New Testament. And so Paul comes to this place to where he, 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 he prays for the church. He prays for believers in this way because Paul knew that whatever you root your life in, guess what? It's eventually going to come out. Whatever it is, it's, 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 it's eventually going to break the surface. A lot of times in life, we look at what breaks the surface. We look at what the fruit, we look at the, what breaks the surface. But what Paul says, we need to look sometimes at beneath the surface because it's those things, those things that you and I are rooted in will break the surface. Oh, and guess what? And usually through difficult times. And so we're going to see that uh, as we look at that. So here's the prayer, starting in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16 uh, and following. This is a prayer, Paul. He says, so I pray that, that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with, with power 
in your inner being. So you're going to realize how much Paul prays for beneath the surface stuff in somebody's life. A lot of times we pray for above the surface stuff, right? We pray about their actions. We pray about their words. We pray about their choices. Why are they making that choice? But Paul goes about it a totally different way. Paul understood this issue, just the power of a root. You do not support your root. Your root supports you. And so you notice that. And so he says the power of your inner being through his spirit. And so that's capital S, Holy Spirit. And that Christ may dwell again in your hearts, beneath the surface, in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width and height and depth of God's love. And to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do, do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so Paul is try, praying for this church and he's praying for believers to understand how much God loves you. Because if you understand how much God loves you, it like changes everything. It like changes. That's, that's why John wrote in 1 John. In fact, is in the month of June, we're going to go through the, 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 the first John, the, the John letters. First, second, I think third John. I know there's three. I don't know if we're preaching through all three. But we're looking at the letters of John in going through, going through June. And John comes in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. John comes to this place and says, it changes our life when we understand how much God loves us. See, that's why the benediction that we do here is so important. And I preached about that last weekend, that line, may he make his face shine upon you. To where you understand how much he loves you, that he delights in you that he cares for you even when you're going through difficulty. Something happened in my spirit. It was Friday, and I'm doing a, I'm doing a funeral for a family in our church, and, and I'm sitting up here on the platform, and Jean, Jean's a member of our church, and Jean comes up. I didn't even know Jean could sing, but Jean was amazing. And Jean sang a song, I Saw the Lord. And listen, I've heard that song thousands of times, thousands, and I don't know why it hit me differently this time. And so he's singing this song, I saw the Lord, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, I saw the Lord. But it was, it was, it was, it was three words, I saw the Lord, and he saw me. And I had this moment. A lot of times we think about us seeing him, but every thought, he sees you. And he delights in you. And he loves you. And he cares for you. See, that's what that means when he makes his face shine upon you. And so Paul is writing about this issue, just trying to get believers, just trying to get people to understand how much God loves you. God is for you. God is, listen, God is for you. Even in drought, even in difficulty, even in those times in life, John 15, 8, he goes, oh, Jesus says, My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. So whatever is rooted in you will come out, good fruit or bad fruit. And what Jesus is saying, Jesus is talking about this issue of fruit. He's talking about producing fruit. And so he says fruit brings glory to God. So when, when good fruit is produced in my life and when good fruit is produced in your life, it brings God glory. You realize that. That's the way you glorify God. It's just by the lifestyle in which you live. And then bearing fruit shows that, that, that I'm a believer. I mean, Jesus talked about that. Jesus says, by this, all men shall know that you are mine, by, by the fruit and some of those other things. John the Baptist, John the Baptist called this the fruit of repentance, to where you come with a change of mind that leads to a change of direction, to where you accept him, and as a result of that, there is actually a transformed life. There's something different about your life. And then there's this ongoing communion with Jesus, this ongoing worship and this ongoing communion with Jesus. And then, and then you realize that, guess what? God intends for us to bear much fruit. And so when we look at this, we have to understand, well, what is fruit? I mean, what is fruit? What is the fruit he's talking about? Here's the interesting thing. Paul actually gives us a definition of that in Galatians 5.22. He says, he says, the fruit is this, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, such things are, are, are uh, there, is, there, there is no law. And so it's this ability of the believer 
to be able to produce this fruit in our life, regardless of the season, of joy and peace and love and just, man, just kindness and gentleness and self-control. That's why Jesus says, apart from me, you, you can't produce this fruit. Apart from me, you can, you can do nothing. Just remain in me, and I'll remain in you, because a, a branch cannot produce fruit unless it's connected, connected to the vine. And Jesus went on in John 15, 16, he says, and you did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit that your fruit should remain. That word should remain, that's eternal fruit. That's fruit that will last into heaven. I mean, that's, not, that's just not temporary fruit. That is fruit that goes with you to heaven. So that whatever you ask in the Father's name, my name, he will, he will give you. And so I want to give you three things, and we'll, we'll take communion together at the close of this message about this issue of deeply rooted and how do you and I become deeply rooted and what does that mean? The first thing is this, you and I have to come to the place and say, I'm, I must cultivate deep roots. I mean, it's something that you actually, you have to do. You have to take responsibility for your spiritual life. We would call this discipleship to where reading the word and praying and learning doctrine and community with other believers and, and some of those other things. You'd, you'd find that the starting point of the Christian life is coming to the place and said, you know what, I'm going to develop some root in my life because without a root, there is no fruit. There is no fruit without, without being rooted in him. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7 and 8, and, and our, our worship team, the, the ladies on our worship team, some of the ladies wrote a worship song called Living Water. This is one of the verses that they used. And so here, here's, what the, here's what Jeremiah is writing. He says, the person who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is in the Lord, is blessed. He will, he will be like a tree. A tree in the Old Testament represented a life, a person. He will be a tree planted by the water. It sends its roots towards a stream, the living water. And we know that to be Jesus. It doesn't fear when he comes and its foliage remains green. In other words, it still produces fruit. I mean, it doesn't even seem like that sentence should go together, right? When the heat comes, it seems like the leaves should dry up and no more fruit. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. And so this verse tells us that there's two times that it's going to, in life, that circumstances or situations are going to expose how deep your roots are or what, what you're rooted in, if you will. And so when you go through heat or when you go through drought or when you go through those dry times of life. And so when you look at this, the first thing he said, he says, you know what? What's going to expose it is when the heat is on in your life. And so I take that to mean when you read these scriptures, that's the, that's the pressures of life. And when the pressures of life come, I mean, when you get squeezed, what comes out of you? Whatever is rooted in you. And so what he's talking about, he's talking about the spiritual, he's talking about the pressures of life. And that if you don't have spiritual roots, if you're not deeply rooted in him, then you and I will have a tendency to live in fear. You and I will have a tendency to, to panic. And so I think of, of maybe just an illustration that we can use in Colorado. I, can th I think it's kind of the difference between aspen trees and, and like tumbleweeds. I mean, when you look at aspen trees, I had to learn about that. We don't have aspen trees in, co in Texas because we had very little beauty in Texas. And so, uh, and I know you said, even though you didn't say it out loud, you said, amen, you're finally learning. It's taken you almost 30 years. We had a beauty of our own. And actually, I feel like I'm in Texas now with as much rain as we're getting. Holy cow. But anyway, we need to move on. But when you look at aspen trees, you realize aspen trees live in colonies. They live in colonies, and their roots go deep, and their roots go, go, go wide. And they're able, when you study them, you're able to learn that they're able to survive forest fires because the roots go beneath the, the heat of the fire. And then after the fire is like desolated a mountainside or devastated it, then they will have new growth. They will sprout new, 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 um, new branches or new trunks or whatever it's called after the fire is burned out. And so the reason that aspen trees can withstand heat or with fire is because, is because of their root, because of their root system. Uh, Proverbs says this in Proverbs 12, 3, no one can, can be made secure by wickedness. But the root of the righteous, I just love this, the root of the righteous is immobile. Man, when, when you and I are deeply rooted, 
and the heat comes, and the pressure comes, what he says, he says, we are immovable. It means to be firmly rooted in him. It means to be secure. It means to be flourishing, even, even when there's pressure, even when the heat is on, even when it's difficult. I mean, it's figuratively, this is used, and it means a person that even when the heat is on is, is, is still of a sound mind and safe and secure and will not be moved from who they are in Christ. But another season that he says will expose your root system and my root system as well is will not worry in a year of drought. And that word worry in the Hebrew is actually deeper than that. Carry, carry anxiety. Carry anxiety in a, in a, in a year of drought when, when resources are limited or there, there's a finance. You can go through all kinds of droughts. I've gone through several droughts in, in life, and maybe you would say the same thing. To her, maybe it's a financial drought, or maybe it's a, maybe it's a professional or a job or career drought, or maybe it's, maybe it's a health drought, whether it's you or whether it's a loved one, whether it's a friend that you're praying for or walking with. Maybe it's a professional drought. Maybe, maybe it's a marriage drought. Maybe you go through a season of a, a dry season in your marriage or a dry season in some relationships and same things you walk through. Maybe it's a dry drought in parenting, or maybe it's a drought in the economy. Maybe it's a drought in things that are going on in our world, in our country, and some of those other things. But a drought in your life is whenever you have to do without something that you feel like you really need, and you don't have it. And it zaps the time and energy and, 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 and money and support out of, out of your life. And, and maybe you're sitting here tonight and saying, you know what, I, I think I'm going through a drought right now that really nobody even knows about. I, I'm walking through a drought right now. Because there will be times in your life and there will be times in my life that all of us, when the heat comes or a drought comes, that we're going to have to do without some things that we feel like we really need. When you study trees, you realize that it's in the dry seasons, the droughts of a tree's life that it, the, the trunk strengthens, and that's what allows it to stand. And the same is with us because it's in those dry seasons that a lot of times we have to realize that we need to dig deeper roots. And we need to be deeply. See, I love that. That's why Paul prayed, it, pray, prayed that. Paul just didn't pray that I pray that you have roots in Christ Paul was praying not that you would have shallow roots or surface roots. Paul was saying, I'm praying that you're deeply rooted in him. And I am praying that your roots go down so deep it goes down beneath the surface to where the fire cannot affect it. And the drought cannot affect it. And the dry times of life cannot affect it. Because if you, listen, if you and I do not have roots, then we will be uprooted or we will, we will have no direction and that's what I think of of tumbleweeds. I've never experienced tumbleweeds like I have in Colorado. Every once in a while, we'd see them in, in West Texas, but not, not like in Colorado. I mean, they, they like run in herds, right? <laughs> and it's crazy. It is literally craziness. I've never seen, I've never seen any of this. T tumbleweed, when you look at it, is, is really, truly, it's an entire plant that doesn't have a root system. It's been broken off from the root system, and as a res result of that, it's a dead plant. It's no longer living, and you know what? It is not deeply rooted. It is not immovable. It is going wherever the wind, wherever the, the, the wind will take it, right, into anything. Many years ago, Pastor Dwayne was on staff, and, and uh, we had an early morning meeting, and so I get a text from him, and um, if you've never experienced a text from Dwayne, you have not experienced a text. A lot of information. So he goes, it starts out, LOL, dot, dot, dot. He said, <laughs> he goes, LOL, then dot, dot, dot. This is hilarious. I said, well, you just said that. But anyway, and then dot, dot, dot. He says, I'm going to be really, really late for our meeting this morning. Problem with tumbleweeds. I'm like, so I texted back because I'm kind of just to the point. Really? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Couldn't you come up with something else? He goes, no, serious. I'm going to be really late, probably going to be dealing with tumbleweeds the rest of the day. I says, you've got to be kidding. He goes, no, it's unbelievable. They've taken over the house. They have literally taken over. They, they have taken over the house. I texted back for an approved time off. I'm going to need a pic. I'm going to need a picture. So here's the picture. Do we not have a picture? It was in the drop box. 
are the one. Oh, no. Can you find the picture, Shay? Okay, hold that thought. The whole sermon's built around this picture. <laughs> I could pull it up on my phone. Can I airdrop it? Anyway, they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. So when you look at, there, thank you guys. You're amazing. That's it. That's the front door of his house. That's literally the front door. The new owners that bought Dwayne's house go to our church, and I told them, I showed them that picture. I said, you need to, I'm just going to prepare you. And so Dwayne, he spent almost two days on this project because Dwayne didn't want to, like, take the tumbleweeds and shove them out into the, 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 the street and then let the tumbleweeds, you know, the next neighbor have to deal with it. He didn't want to do that. And so he literally found a guy with, I think, a backhoe or something, a front-end loader, and they were doing construction down the street, and they shoved the tumbleweeds in, and they took it down the street and shoved it in a dumpster. That's what they did with that. And so thank you, Shay. You're awesome for doing that. And so when you look at this, you realize that you and I have a choice. We can, even li we can either live life like a tumbleweed or we can live life like an aspen. When you look at tumbleweeds, you realize that they're just drifting through life. And it's, it's what James talked about. James talked about, about, about being beaten by the wind or, or tossed back and forth by the wind or tossed back and forth by the waves, that they really had no direction. They had no peace. They were, they were being driven by their circumstances. They were being driven. They were just trying to make it through. And that's why he says, it will not worry or have anxiety in a year of drought are seas producing fruit. This is so interesting to me. So Jeremiah says, he says, oh, a year of drought. We can survive a day of drought, right? And we can probably survive pretty easily a week of drought or a month of drought or maybe a few weeks or six months of a drought. But Jeremiah says, no. He says, how about a, how about a, how about a, how about a year of drought? Really, when you look at the, just how the Hebrew is, is phrased in there, it's a drought that the individual didn't know if it would be a year or two years or three years or four years. How about that drought? You ever gone through a drought? I have. You ever gone through a drought and you say, well, this will ever end? You ever gone through a drought and says, you know what, I think I'm going to be in this forever. Will this ever end? See, those are the worst kind of drought. If someone tells you and me that, guess what, you're going to make it, and in, in this time next year, you, you're going to get that breakthrough, and everything's going to change, change, then we can, we, can, we can suck it up, and we can make it. But when there's no end date, when there's no end date, and we're talking about a season, he's talking about a season of drought. See, that's why he's saying, that's why Paul's praying, I pray. I pray that you are deeply, deeply rooted. And I think it's becoming more and more important in the times in which you and I live, guess what? That you better be deeply rooted in him. And you better be deeply rooted in what you believe and why you believe it. Because everything's starting to change, right? And everything's starting to come at believers and Bible-believing Christians that stand on his word. And so, so he goes on and he helps us understand in Psalm 1, Chapter 1, verse 2, how do you develop these roots? Look at it. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. So now he's talking about God's word. Now he's talking about God's word. And he meditates on it day and night. And he is like a tree. So there, a, a tree planted, a life planted beside flowing streams. You know what that is? Living water. That bears fruit in its seasons. And its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he still spiritually prospers. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. When you look at this, you, what a promise. And he says, he says, so you have to come to the place. And you start learning. Listen, you start learning just to read God's Word. And I know starting out it is awkward. And there's things in there that it's hard to understand or you may not understand. But you just you have to start somewhere. Just start somewhere of just reading God's word. Oh, and then he says, and he, he meditates on it. He, in other words, he fills his mind. See, 
See, we as Christians, a lot of time, we look at life journal, we look at, at, at Bible reading is maybe something we do at the morning and we, we read, we pray, we close our Bibles, and we go on about our day. The Jews didn't do that. Paul didn't do that. Three times a day, morning, noon, and in the evening. And they would pull it out or they would remember that verse and they would meditate on it in my in my iPhone with my reminder. I, I've had to come to the place to where I, I put daily reminders in the, you know, the first thing I do in the morning is, is I, I have my time and I read scripture and pray and life journal and all those other things. And then I have another time that I get a reminder midway through and sometimes I'll type a verse in or sometimes I'll type a thought in. And, and then all, and you, and all of a sudden, midday, I am remembering that verse that, that is before me. And then, then in the evening, the, the, the same thing. And I've told you this principle that Karen and I have lived by, first word, last word. That God should have the first word in our day and the last word in our day. And so we end the day with just a word, just his word, just a reminder. Colossians 2.6, Paul's writing and Paul says this. He says, so then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him. So how do you walk in him? The way you received him. How did you receive him? By faith. So you continue to walk by, him, by faith being rooted and built up, established in faith, just as you were taught, and overflowing with gratitude. Can I just tell you this real quickly? You know when you're struggling and you are not deeply rooted in him is when there's not much gratitude in your life. Not much thanksgiving. Not much, God, I am grateful for. Some of, the, some of the darkest times that we have walked through as a family. It was, just a, it was just a medical drought. It was just a drought. And there wasn't much evidence of anything breaking the surface yet. We ended every one of our days at mealtime listing out three things we were grateful for. And what are you grateful for? What are you thankful for? What are you grateful for in this season? What are you thankful for in this season? I'm telling you, gratitude. Gratitude will change your life. That we can all find something just to be grateful for. The second thing is this. If we're going to be deeply rooted in him, uh, I must eliminate some weeds. And this is timely because this is something we're all doing, right? I mean, it is spring, and, and it is like raining, and, and, uh, and things are sprouting, and things are growing, and things are blooming. And Jesus illustrated this real clearly in a parable of the sower and the seed, and many of us knows about that. And Jesus talked about the four different soils, the four different types of heart. And so we can fluctuate, I believe, in a lifetime, in, in a season, we can fluctuate between all the soils. I don't, and so so there's, the, there's the hard heart to where a heart, a heart just becomes hardened because of the, the drought, because of the dry time, and they don't, they're not deeply rooted in him. And then there's the impulsive heart is what, the, what he says, and there's the crowded heart. And then there's the good heart, the soft soil that, that responds to the word. And so, so Luke chapter 8, verse 14, we know this, the seed is the word of God. In verse 14 it says, And as for the seed that fell among the thorns, these are the ones who, when they have heard, go on their way and are choked with worries, riches, and pleasures of life and produce no mature, look at that, no mature, mature fruit. No love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. And what are the weeds? What are the weeds in your life? I mean, I went to the Webster Dictionary, and it's just like an undesired, it's just hilarious, it's an undesired plant. One that tends, that is not desired, one that tends to overgrow and choke out the desired plants in your garden. And the weeds in my life and the weeds in your life is anything that hinders or limits spiritual growth. Things that choke out your relationship to Christ and things that choke you from growing deeper in him. Weeds can be what he says, the temporary concerns, the riches and the, and the pleasures. And you look at Jesus, and Jesus had this rhythm all the way through the Gospels. And Jesus had a rhythm of pulling away in silence and solitude and spending time with the Father and the, the reading of Scripture and the prayer and, and rest and, and Sabbath and, 
and worship. I mean, Jesus continued to go to the synagogue. He t- continued to preach in the synagogue. And he had this worship. And if Jesus, if Jesus had that rhythm, then, then, then we need that rhythm. And Jesus says, if you're not careful, you, there, there's some weeds that can come up and choke out the good things in your life, whether it's cares and, and concerns or whether it's worries, whether it's riches, whether it's pleasure, that all of a sudden they dominate you and they dominate your thinking to where it crowds out the things of, of God in your life. And that's why you, you hear people. You just listen to them talking sometimes and say, well, you know, I, 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 don't have time, I don't have time to read Scripture. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to worship. I don't have time. And, and you hear how it just chokes out the good things in someone's life. And here's the interesting thing. There's a difference between like a weed and a vegetable. A vegetable, you, I mean, you have to work hard for a vegetable, right? You got to plant it. You got to feed it. You got to water it. You got to fertilize it. I mean, you have to work it. And so what do you do with a weed? <laughs> Absolutely nothing, and it grows, right? I mean, it's craziness. It's craziness. You do absolutely nothing. It doesn't matter. It just, it just grows. And so whenever you see weeds in someone's garden, my, my, my mom is like a gardener. I mean, she is an amazing gardener. And it's, it, I mean, she loves, as she would say, she loves to have her hands in the dirt. That's it's just something spiritual for her. And my mom is a gardener. And my mom will tell you, if there are weeds in her garden, she says it's a sign of neglect. It's just a sign of neglect, and this is what Jesus is talking about. This is what, what the writer, what Jeremiah is talking about, about deeply rooted. The last thing is this, is I must cooperate with God, that I have to come to the place and cooperate with God. Jesus says this in John 15, 1 and 2, I'm the true vine, and my father's the, my father's the gardener. It's one of my mom's favorite verses because she says, you know, I'm a gardener, and God was a gardener. And so, uh, verse 2, every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. And so, when you, when you, when you look at this, you realize that, that, that God, from time to time, prunes us. And sometimes he uses drought, and sometimes he uses people, and sometimes he uses pressure in your life. And so when you look at this issue of pruning, it, you're cutting off, he's cutting off some of the dead branches, but also he cuts off some of the living branches as well. Why? So that the plant will produce more l- later. And so we know this, pruning is essential for increased productivity. The same in growing a plant and the same in a spiritual life. And so God says, I prune you for your own good. Even though none of us like it, right? I'm going to cut away some things for your own good. And I prune you for your effectiveness. I prune you so that you will develop what? Not shallow roots, but roots that are deep in me. And he says that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prune you. And when you and I go through times of pruning, I'm telling you, it can be some of the most confusing times of your spiritual life, right? When all of a sudden God starts cutting some things away and cutting some things back, especially some of the, what you consider some of the good things, right? I mean, every year when we prune our rose bushes back, sometimes we prune them back and they're still about ready to bud, but you still prune them back. Why? For the health of the plant. For the health of, it's not just the dying things, it's, it's also for the health, of, for, for plants that are, are producing, and so when, a lot of times when you go through pruning, if you and I are not careful, and if you don't have deep roots, that you will push back and you will say, God, do you not love me? With the pressure that I have, the drought that I'm going through, God, do you, the things you're cut, do you not love me? Are you angry with me? Are you putting me on the shelf? Are you done with me? Why are you doing this to me? It's a big mistake. Just real quickly, we just have to understand this. It's a big mistake for you and I to look at pruning like punishment. Pruning is not punishment. Pruning is for the future. Punishment is for the past. Pruning is positive. Punishment is negative. And so when you look at this, you realize that, that it's out of love that he prunes you. That's why, that's, why, that's, why Paul, that's why Paul said, I pray that you're not only deeply rooted in him, but you know his height, his depth, his width, and his length of his love for you. You have to know. You have to know how much he loves you. 
You have to know how much he cares for you. Because here's, here's what you and I have a tendency. When things get uncomfortable and he starts pruning some things away from us, if we're not careful, we won't remain. We won't remain in him because of that. And he knows that. That's why he came back and said, he came back and said, just remain in me. Just remain in me. See, there's, there's some things that we can do. If you just ask the question, can God's pruning in your life and my life fail? Yes, it can. It can fail when we don't cooperate with him. It can fail when we no longer remain in him. That's why he says, remain in me. Remain in me. A lot of times when we go through times of pressure and times of drought or pruning, if you start questioning God's love for you, you'll push, this, you'll push Scripture away. And so I can't even read Scripture right now. I'm just angry. I'm hurt and I'm angry with what's going on. You know, I can't even go to church. I can't even worship. I can't even, I'm not even going to pray. And that's why he says, you know what, it's so important. It's so important that you remain in me. I, I, I believe. When I go through a drought, and I, when I go through a drought, I believe you better press deeper into him and try to get roots down as deep as you can. So we cultivate roots by the daily reading of Scripture, whether we like it or we not. Whether you're going through a good time or a bad time. In the weekly worship. And we learn to see his face and to feel his presence and to trust his love. And there's some times that we need to eliminate some weeds in our life. And we ask him, Lord, what's keeping me from you right now? What's keeping me from opening up the scriptures and praying? What's keeping me from serving you for minutes? What, what's keeping me from that? Is it worry? Is it anxiety? Is it cares of the word, world? Is it pleasure? Is it, is it well? Wh whatever it is. Because God, I, I need, I need to have roots and I have need to have deep roots in you. As we take communion together, there's, the elements are in front of you and and seat back in front of you if you're on the front row and then it's in the cup holder next to you. The Apostle Paul was talking and writing in the New Testament and before they took of the bread and took of the wine in the New Testament, Paul gave them an opportunity to examine their life. And the bread and the juice represents his body and his blood that was given for us for the forgiveness of sin. And maybe you just need, just real briefly, before we take of the bread and we take of the juice, maybe you just need to take a moment and examine your life and say, are what are the weeds in my life? I mean, what, what are the things that are keeping me from him? Am I angry about something? Am I sad about something? Am I happy? Am I glad about something? Maybe you have a need. And maybe you just need to tell him that, Lord, I have a need. And I'm in a drought. And I'm... And I, I'm in a need, whether it's a relational drought, a financial drought, a marriage drought. A, maybe you're going through a difficult time in your dating life. Maybe it's a career. Maybe it's school. Whatever it is, would you just tell him? I'm, we don't understand it. 
but we know it's in Scripture when Jesus, when, when Paul said, then when we take of communion, his presence, his presence is with us. So maybe we would just seek his face or see his face. Feel his presence and trust his Lord, his love. Father, we thank you We just thank you for your love. And like John got to the place where he says, I just came to the place that I, I know you love me. David got to that place in the deepest drought that he ever went through. And in the middle of the drought, David made the statement and says, the only thing I know right now is God is for me. God's for me. And the Lord, actually, your word teaches us the proof of your love for us is while we were still sinners, you went to the cross and you took on our sin and you were crucified so that we may have eternal life with you. And honestly, the bread and the juice represents how much you love us and that you gave your life for us. And so as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, may we know that you love us and that we're forgiven. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Scripture says that on the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you take of the bread with me, please? Paul went on to say that after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is a new covenant in my blood, which is for you. So because of his blood for us on the cross, we're totally and completely forgiven, deeply loved by him. Fathers, we take this juice. May we know that we are forgiven and that you love us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Would you take of the juice? Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? Let me ask you with your heads bowed and eyes closed, what is God saying to you? whatever he's saying to you, would you just just be obedient? Just do it and just follow him. Maybe you're here this evening and say, you know what? I just need someone to pray for me. And if that is you, we want to pray for you. We do this every weekend at every close of every one of our services. And so if you're walking through a drought, if you're walking through a dry time in your life and you just say, I need prayer, then we want to pray for you. And every one of us needs prayer. But from time to time, we just need somebody with flesh on that can add their faith to our faith and they can pray for us. And so if that is you this evening, we want to pray for you. And we want to encourage you and comfort you and strengthen you through, through prayer and through, uh, through a conversation. So if you would like prayer this morning or this evening, if you're carrying a, a burden, we'd like to lift that in just a few moments. I'm going to pray. We're going to stand. And then as we stand together in a few minutes, if you need prayer, you can, as you stand up, you can make your way to the front. There's going to be people walking with you. There's prayer partners going to be down here. We'll meet you, we'll greet you, and then there's something for every one of us to do, whether we're standing and praying for ourselves or those who are responding or we're responding. So if you need prayer, you come. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your love, and we thank you for your grace. Thank you for the power of your name. Would you draw us very closely to you? And would we respond to you tonight 
in prayer for those that are carrying a burden. And where they find comfort, encouragement, and support. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with me? And then as you stand, just real quickly, as you stand, stand up, would you step out? Would you begin making your way down to the front? We have some prayer partners making their way down. We have some people responding in prayer. But if you need prayer in any of your life for any reason, we just want to pray for you. So if you'd make your way down to the front, you just have to tell us your name and how we can pray for you. And we'd love to have the opportunity to pray for you. We'd love to have the opportunity to, to encourage you and to help you. So you just make your way down. We'll guide you. We'll direct you. Tell us your name and how we can pray for you. And we'd love to have the opportunity to pray for you. We'd love to have the opportunity to encourage you. You just keep coming. You just keep coming. Um, we'll guide you and direct you. You just keep coming. Tell us your name and how we can pray for you. Then there's a connect card in the seat back in front of you. If you'd li like to communicate with us, we'd love to communicate with you. And so you can take that connect card out, whether you want to be a part of, of Discover Fellowship on the 21st. You can do that online. You can do that through the card. Whether you want to be baptized, we have baptisms coming up. We already have people scheduled for to get baptized. We'd love to include you in that. If you've never been baptized after accepting Christ, uh, then we would love to include you in on that. You can indicate that as well. If you'd like to have a conversation with a pastor, we would love to meet with you, have a conversation with you as well. And so you can take that card, complete that, place it in the box on your way out. And then for our benediction, may you receive this as a word of the Lord for you. May the Lord bless you. And may the Lord protect you. And may the Lord make his face shine upon you. And may the Lord give you grace and just be gracious to you. And may the Lord give you peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you and thank you for being here tonight.